Welcome to all of you who are viewing this Monday Thursday service to Trinity Lutheran Church here in Waukesha. We're glad that you've joined us. We welcome you not only to worship God tonight, but we also welcome you to worship God on Good Friday. The service will be posted tomorrow by three o'clock and again on Easter Sunday to come and celebrate Easter with us. I've been asked to announce that we're going to be having a private communion here at the church on Good Friday morning. Simply call the church office for appointments between nine o'clock and 12 o'clock. We also wanna thank you for your support of our congregation during this time of quarantine. We know it's been a difficult time and we want you to know that we're praying for you. We also wanna let you know that we're thankful for the offerings that you've shared with us, whether you've mailed them in, dropped them off at the church office, or you're also free to use the link trinitywaukesha.com give. Let's worship the Lord this Monday, Thursday evening as we follow the order of service. We worship the Lord singing hymn number 136. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. Whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. And in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. 
for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble. And surround me with songs of deliverance. You may be seated. Our first reading appointed for tonight, this Monday, Thursday, is recorded for us in the Old Testament book of Exodus, reading from chapter 24. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, Everything the Lord said, we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up twelve strong stone pillars representing the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls, and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapsus lazuli as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God. And they ate and drank. This is the word of the Lord.
The second reading appointed for this Monday, Thursday, is recorded for us in the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Christians at Corinth, reading from chapter 11, verse 23. In our reading, the Apostle Paul gives instructions on how to celebrate Holy Communion. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is, give, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. This is the word of the Lord. respect for the words and works of Jesus, please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for tonight is recorded for us in the words of John chapter 13. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon, Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. A new command I give you love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated.
By his wounds, we are healed. Isaiah prophesied these words about the coming Messiah 700 years before Jesus was even born. And Jesus himself fulfilled those words this Holy Week. And because of that, God's grace, his mercy, and his peace belong to you and me freely through faith in Christ. God's word for this Monday Thursday message is recorded for us in the Gospel of Luke, reading from chapter 22. While he, that is Jesus, was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? This is God's word. We pray, Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your inspired word is truth. Amen. In the sweet name of the Savior Jesus, my dear Christian friends, these days we become more keenly aware that technology is certainly a gift from our good and gracious God. I mean, the fact that you're viewing this sermon right now, online, is living proof that God loves us and he desires to feed our fragile Christian faith. But we also need to know that we need to remain connected to Jesus, and that's why God provides for us tonight. We also need to be more aware that the devil also can hijack technology, and he also can use technology as a tool against us. And here's what I mean. Have you ever received an official-looking email with an innocent email attachment that said, just click here and win a prize. Maybe you double-clicked it without even realizing it. And instantly, a malicious code was infecting your computer that the next time you accessed your bank account or some personal information, it would simply be silently shared across the internet, across the country, and maybe across the world. What satanic sabotage that can virtually happen to any of us? This kind of program is known as a Trojan horse. Now, a Trojan horse gets its name from uh, the Trojan War that was fought between the city of Troy and the nation of Greece about the year 1100 BC. To give you some Bible context, about the time of the Old Testament, prophet Samuel. After a 10-year siege of the city, the Greeks constructed a giant Trojan hollow horse, filled it with an elite group of Greek soldiers, and pretended to sail away in defeat as they placed it right at the city gates of Troy. Well, the city of Troy, thinking that they had won, brought that horse in as a victory, you could say, as a trophy. Well, in the middle of the night, that elite force snuck out of the horse, opened up the city gates of Troy, and let the rest of the Greek army in. That devastated the city and won a stunning victory. What a tragic turn of events. Our sermon reading from Luke chapter 22 was also a tragic turn of events for one of the closest followers of Jesus, one of the original 12 disciples. His name will live in infamy. infamy. His name was Judas. Now think about it. Judas heard the same sermon, just like all the 11 disciples did. He also witnessed all of the miracles that Jesus did, proving that he was the Son of God. And Judas even did mission work. For Jesus, just like all the others. But now Judas, the faithful disciple, becomes Judas the betrayer. What happened? In a matter of speaking, the great deceiver, the devil, planted a Trojan horse, gained control of Judas's heart, and turned him against Jesus. Now just think about it. If this could happen, to one of the closest followers of Jesus, why can't this happen to you and to me? 
Now you know the meaning of the phrase, there by the grace of God, go I. On this Monday, Thursday of Holy Week, we need to be more aware how important it is that Jesus remains our warrior who fights for us against the devil who's constantly trying to use our sinful flesh against us. No doubt, this battle is personal. And as we take a closer look at the words of Luke chapter 22, we're going to hear how the struggle is real. But we'll also hear this struggle is only really resolved by Jesus, our Savior, who fights for us. Our sermon reading took place right after Jesus and his disciples had their last supper together on that Monday, Thursday of Holy Week, where they celebrated Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, for the very first time. And now they had gone to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Do you remember what happened? Even after all of them boldly claimed, I'll never leave you, Jesus, what happened to every single one of them? They fell asleep, not just once, twice, but three times. And each time Jesus graciously, lovingly went to wake them up. Finally, Jesus was giving them and us a warning of what our flesh is capable of. Well, Jesus said this, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Here is the place where our sermon reading literally picks up. For it says in the words of Luke chapter 22, While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Now this situation is really messed up. I mean, the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and John, fill in the details for us. There was a reason that Judas dramatically kissed Jesus. He was singling him out for the Roman soldiers. Remember, it was night outside. How would the Roman soldiers know who to arrest? Well, Judas was telling them. But to some, it must have seemed that Jesus was just greeting his good buddy Jesus with a simple show of affection consistent with Middle Eastern culture. But Judas was twisting this affection to betray Jesus and hand him over to his enemies. It was almost like Judas was screaming, this is the guy, arrest him. Yes, on more than one level, this battle was personal. But thinking back, how could something like this even happen? Well, let's review the Bible facts. I mean, way before this event ever took place, the Bible tells us that Satan entered into Judas's heart. You could say planted a Trojan horse inside him, turned him against Jesus, and sent him to the chief priests and the teachers of the law to get paid for betraying Jesus. And what was the payment price? A million dollars? Oh no. 30 pieces of silver. How much was that worth? Probably about the amount that parents would pay for an Xbox One video game system. Yet right before our reading, Jesus also predicted that one of his disciples would betray him which simply was a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy in Psalm 41. Yet, even though Jesus was literally telling him, I know what you're doing, Judas still went through with his satanic scheming. Just hours earlier, when all of the disciples gathered together in the upper room to celebrate the Passover, what happened? Listen up. It says, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him into him. So Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do quickly. You know what's interesting about our reading right here? Every time that Satan schemed, or that Judas schemed, every single time, Jesus was reaching out to Judas in love. He wasn't just giving him a second, third, and fourth chance. He was constantly showing him 
God's grace and mercy. But what happened? Judas didn't care. He had rejected Jesus and his word. Oh, I'm sure that the struggle inside of Judas was tremendous. I'm sure the battle was personal. And yet, Judas made his choice. He rejected Jesus. He ended up rejecting Jesus for all eternity and missed out on eternal salvation. Yet, let's back up the truck. Earlier that evening, when Jesus first warned the disciples that one of them would betray Jesus? What did all the disciples do? Did they all look at Judas like he was the guy? This is what's surprising. No, the Bible says this. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. Why did they point fingers at each other? Why did they suspect it could be any of them? It's because the disciples knew what each of them were capable of. They knew the human heart. They knew they were born with a sinful flesh. They knew the Bible's word was true, that out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, and sexual sins. Yeah, yes, each one of them had a sinful flesh that would constantly pull them away from Christ. Oh, the battle against sin and against Satan was a very personal one for the disciples, for Judas, and yes, for you and me. And here's what I mean. Despite all of Jesus' warnings to you and me, stay away from sin, especially during this quarantine, especially with the people that God has brought into your life. Be kind, be patient, be loving. What do we find ourselves do to doing? Doesn't it just beg the question, what kind of Trojan horse is Satan trying to use in my heart? I mean, I'm just like you, and we're just like Judas. We're just like St. Paul, who described the battle that's going on inside of every Christian this way in Romans chapter 7. Paul wrote, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Sound familiar? Do you sense the spiritual battle that's going on in your heart? Right today? Maybe even right now? I mean, I so want to follow Jesus with all my heart. I mean, after all, I've been a Wells member for the longest time. And yet I find my spirit myself always under spiritual attack my sinful flesh is weak oh maybe it's some guilt from the past we get this flashback of sin something we've done maybe it's even long ago and something that makes us feel so guilty so dirty so unworthy or maybe it's something that we're struggle with we're struggling with right now you know how those thoughts just so easily enter our head that would make a sailor blush? And how often haven't we fed them with images from the internet and we can't seem to stop? Or maybe it can be described as something like just spiritual laziness. Oh, I know during this quarantine, quarantine I have more time on my hands. I know I could be reading my Bible more or I could be reading the emails that get sent me to, the, from, to me from the church office, but you know, come on, I make the excuse, I'm just so busy. Do you sense the spiritual battle that's going on right now? And if you just approach the spiritual battle with, you know what, I'm just going to try harder, you're going to lose every single time. This spiritual battle can only be resolved by Jesus Christ who is for us. At these critical moments, when Satan seems to be at his worst, my Christian brothers and sisters, remember the rest of the words of Romans chapter 7, which says, Thanks be to God. He gives who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember the rest of Romans chapter 8, which says, If God is for us, who can be against us? 
At these moments, when Satan seems to be roaring in our lives, when this Trojan horse seems to be exploding, remember you're not alone. Jesus is our only sure defense. Our betrayed Jesus never betrayed us. On Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, Jesus went through all that abuse, all of that judgment, alone. Alone, he stood before the judgment of God, taking on the very sin that should damn you and me. And Jesus made us right with God. When Jesus willingly, alone, went to the cross, he knew what was going to happen, and yet he suffered in our place. And when he died on that cross, God cleared sinners of every charge. Yes, Jesus took that personally. And he personally rose from the dead to prove it's all true. Best of all, what does this mean? It means that all the guilt you and I have ever done, now we're free. We're free because God has removed it only through faith in Christ. Yes, Jesus is the starting point in our personal battles against our sinful flesh and the Trojan horses Satan plants in our hearts every single day. We need to remember that Jesus is for us. He's in our corner. He fights for us every single day. Only, get this, my Christian friends, it gets better. Jesus arms us with powerful weapons in the fight. First of all, Jesus gives us His powerful word. His powerful word is described in the Bible like a two-edged sword. First of all, it reveals all that sin that we like to hide. And it cuts away all the guilt of sin and the power of sin so no longer does sin control us. God's word, and every time we hear it, every time we read it, makes our faith stronger and alerts us to those Trojan horses that Satan likes to use. But tonight, this Monday, Thursday, God even gives us more. He gives us his special supper, the Lord's Supper, where along with the bread and wine, Jesus gives us his own body and blood that's truly present to give us the strongest visible proof that we are forgiven. When we feel like we're alone in our struggle, we need to make use of this sacrament to be reminded We're not alone, and that he personally connects us with his body and blood. So use antivirus software and firewalls to keep your computer safe from malicious programs. Wear protective masks, and yes, wash your hands several times a day to keep the COVID virus at bay. But more often than not, we find that our worst war is exactly like that, like the one that Judas fought. The battle is personal. Though the struggle is real, it's really been resolved by Christ who is for us to tell us that we're forgiven, we're destined for heaven, and now with him, we can tackle anything. So don't face the battle of sin alone. Fight the good fight with Jesus. Amen. We confess the faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on page 7 of your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, 
who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, author of the everlasting covenant and giver of the cup of salvation, we gather in your courts to offer you our sacrifice of thanksgiving. For fulfilling your promise to establish a new covenant through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, we give you humble and hearty thanks. As our Lord Jesus Christ gave thanks to you when he broke the bread, and as he gave thanks to you when he took the cup, we also give you thanks. Precious Savior, both priest and offering, awe and wonder fill our hearts as we partake of your body broken for us and your blood shared for us, shed for us. We praise you, bless you, and adore you, Lord Jesus Christ. In our poverty of righteousness, we have nothing to offer. Without your tremendous sacrifice, we would still be in our sins. But through your sacrament of the New Testament, we are assured that our iniquities are forgiven and our sins are no longer remembered. O Holy Spirit, dwell within us as we remember our Lord's death in this sacrament. Enter our hearts to strengthen our faith and fill us with gratitude for your great mercy. Move us to encourage one another to love and to do good works. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. As our Lord served his disciples by washing their feet, so may we also humbly serve one another. Help us live our lives as sacrifices of thanksgiving to him who first loved us. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. stand. We pray. Almighty God, 
Grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.